All right. So we can start now. Good morning. Yay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, um, so today, uh, to, to start us off, I'm going to be talking about um, a radically polyglot team, uh, tales from this radi radically polyglot team. Um, but before I get started with that, um, I'm a, a very vain person, so I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ryan Levick. Um, I'm at Itchy Ankles on Twitter. Um, and I work at uh, a company called Sechs Wunderkinder in Berlin. We make an app called Wunderlist. Uh, Wunderlist, if you're a German speaker. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about how um, at Sechs Wunderkinder we actually use over 10 different programming languages. Um, and what that means for our development, what it means for our company, um, uh, if that is a good idea or not, um, because maybe we're just all insane and we should all go back to programming in Java. Um, but before we get started with sort of examining this question, um, I kind of want to, to get a gauge from the audience here about a couple of things. Um, so who, I mean, this is a, a polyglot conference, so I'm assuming most should raise their hands, but uh, who here uses more than one language? Um, Okay, pretty much, pretty much everyone, that's, that's good. Um, for those who do use more than one language, do you use more than one language at work? If so, raise your hand. Um, again, most people. Does anybody use a language um, in their free time or their fav favorite language in their free time and they do not use it at work at all? Ah, again, most people, all right. So um, let's keep that in mind how most people here do uh, program in multiple languages, but perhaps they're not programming in the language that they want to be programming in when um, they're at work. So to, to start us off, I'm going to sort of talk about um, polyglot development in a historical context, and I'll try and make it quick to, as to not bore everybody. But um, sort of my, my beginning thesis is that um, maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there, there were, this is greatly simplified, but there were fewer programming languages than we have now. We have some C, some C++, Java. Yeah, we had COBOL and Fortran and, and some others, certainly. Um, and then um, there was sort of a Cambrian explosion of things, and, and nowadays we have all this choice that we can use um, between how we want to program. So we have things like Go and Haskell and Rust and what else, Scala things like that, and it's only been within the past 15 to 20 years that sort of this has become more true than it was beforehand. Um, and we also see a, a shift in, in paradigm as well. Um, before the 1980s or the, the mid-1970s, we had procedural programming, then something called object-oriented programming came around, and now we're sort of seeing um, a similar shift where ideas from functional programming that have been around forever and ever are becoming more and more mainstream as well. Um, and the question is, um, if you accept that as what has happened, why? What are some possible explanations for that? Um, and one of the first ones is uh, something called the software crisis. Uh, who here has heard of the software crisis before? So we have a few, uh, few in the room. For those that don't know, um, the software crisis is actually something from way back in the day, um, 60s, early 70s, um, late 50s as well, where people were first starting to create software and it, for computers, um, and they realized they had no idea what they were doing. That should sound familiar to all of us here. Um, they realized that they had these new things called computers, they wanted to tell them what to do, and they had no idea how to do it. Um, they had basic, you know, they could tell the computer what to do, but to build anything complex, things got out of hand rather quickly. Um, so I have a quote here um, that I'd like to read. Uh, the major cause of the software crisis is that the machines have become several orders of magnitude more powerful. To put it quite bluntly, as long as there were no machines, programming was no problem at all. It's true. When we had a few weak computers, programming became a mild problem. And now we have gigantic computers. Programming has become an equally gigantic problem. This is from Dijkstra. I believe this is from 1967. 
So um, whatever he is talking about here is probably way, way, way more true nowadays than it was back then. Because uh, in 1967, I guess the most powerful computer in the world was orders of magnitude less powerful than the phone you have in your pocket. So um, yeah, we are still dealing with these problems today. Um, so for, for, the, for the longest time, um, and arguably still today, when we, when we go and try and solve some problems in programming, what we've done is just go to our toolbox, reach in, uh, and look for a hammer. And hammer the thing we want to hammer. It doesn't quite work the way we do, so we go, oh, of course, shouldn't have used this hammer. I'm going to go ahead and use this hammer instead. And we've hammered at the thing, and then we've placed our tool back in the toolbox, looked at our problem again, said, ah, this didn't quite work. And we've constantly gone in and reached in uh, for another hammer every single time, instead of perhaps reaching for a screwdriver to screw in the screw that we wanted to. Um, and it's quite funny when you look at uh, an example of a, of a problem. Um, here, I guess, is a quick sort implemented in C. Um, and if you are a C programmer, I stole this from Wikipedia. I don't program C, so I have no idea if this is would even run. But um, this is what quicksort looks like uh, in C. And if you sort of imagine it in most programming languages that you use, it probably looks quite similar. Um, you, you tell the computer exactly what to do, down to where to move things in memory. Um, if we look at that, perhaps in, in Haskell, on the other hand, um, it looks quite different. Um, and if you don't understand Haskell, don't worry about it. But basically, hopefully you can gather from this, you don't actually tell the computer exactly what to do. You rather describe the algorithm to the computer, and the computer does it for you. Um, so it's a much more declarative style. But even this is sort of, you know, words in a text file that are being interpreted and run somewhere. It's maybe not fundamentally different, um, but at least it's sort of a, a movement in the right direction to trying to change how we handle software. And this is just a, a small micro example of that. Um, so the next thing about why we maybe have moved towards having more and more programming languages is the internet. Um, the internet has made certain things about using, creating, building new programming languages much easier. We have things like GitHub now and open source, um, whereas 30 years ago, if you wanted to work on a programming language, you either did it by yourself with your friends or you worked for a major company somewhere um, doing it. Things like uh, Rust, which is sort of being built by officially supported by Mozilla, but being built by a community, uh, basically by committee, would sort of be impossible to do. Um, the, the oversight that the Rust uh, uh, contributors have from the community as large is sort of something that's unheard of. Same with languages like Elixir, which have also been built sort of by the community that will end up using it as opposed to a select few. Um, it's also a lot easier to learn programming languages today. Um, the other day, I, was, I read a tweet by Gary Bernhardt with, that said he learned his first programming language with no book at all, not even a syntax guide. So he sort of entered things in the computer. They probably didn't run, and he had to figure out why on his own without any help whatsoever. Um, I learned uh, programming in the age of the internet. Um, where that was not the case. Um, I had things, free online resources, things like Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby, um, or you know, Learn Yo Haskell for Great Good, which are both available free online and are great resources for learning um, programming languages. There's also, of course, forums and Stack Overflow. Um, things are more and more easy uh, to learn nowadays than they were uh, back in the day. And lastly, um, we have new problems that we sort of want to face with these, these new programming languages. Um, the Dijkstra quote before hopefully is illustrative of things haven't changed in terms of complexity, but they have changed in sort of what we want to accomplish with it. You know, we have a whole distributed system called the internet out there that didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. Uh, the World Wide Web didn't exist then. And um, we now have problems that we need to solve for this new thing that didn't exist when some of our programming languages that we use still today were first invented. Um, but we have, uh, does anybody know who this is? 
This is Gordon Moore here, Moore's Law. Does ever, is everybody familiar with Moore's Law? If you are familiar, raise your hand. Yeah, so hopefully you also know that Moore's Law pretty much doesn't exist anymore. Um, the free lunch is over, so to say. So we can't just keep building the same things and waiting for it to get faster next year because it just won't. Um, we, have, we have to start taking advantage of multiple cores on the same machine or even taking advantage of multiple machines within a network. And if you try and do this in something like C, um, has anybody done like uh, a lot of um, uh, parallel or uh, concurrent programming in, in C or C++? Anybody here? Um, was, it, was it fun or easy? So um, I'm looking and seeing a lot of shaking heads. I've never done it myself, um, but I've done it in even much more high level languages like Ruby and it's not fun at all. Um, we have things like, uh, we have uh, primitives like threads and things that just are not easy to work with um, when you have to do things in a massively parallel way. Um, and there are other languages that sort of attack this um, head on, uh, things like Erlang for instance. Um, and uh, that sort of leads into the fact that we have a much more complex world that we have to tackle as well. Um, I want to talk about this real quick. Does anybody know what this is right here? This is the, the Mars uh, lunar lander or something like that. The, uh, what happened here was that um, I guess there were several companies that had been con contracted to build um, this thing. One of them was an American company, I believe it was Boeing, that built it and they were using Imperial units and everybody else was sane and using metric and there was something lost in there. Um, what, what for many people who use um, more advanced languages like Haskell would say, oh, we would have caught that at compile time because it would just be a type error. Um, they of course were using C um, where there basically are no types effectively. and it crashed and uh, I think it was several billion dollars sort of down the hole um, because of a type error. So um, now that's sort of like a high level overview of my sort of understanding of where, where we're coming from, where we are in terms of polyglot development, why we are where we are, why we have so many programming languages. And now I want to talk about where I work um, and sort of how we take these ideas to the organization level. Um, so before we get into that, I want to just briefly describe how we're organized. Um, this isn't exactly true, I think I, yeah, there we go. This isn't exactly true, but um, we have sort of client teams that handle the web, iOS, Mac, Windows, so on and so forth, and we have a backend team as well that handles the backend infrastructure. This is the way you can think about it, although in practice that's not really how we work. but. Um, Within these teams, we use over 10 different languages. Um, and here's a, a rough list. It actually needs to be updated now because I just introduced Elixir as our next uh, language that we have. But we have things, anything from Objective-C all the way to Haskell and Scala and Ruby. So we use them for, for various reasons. And there's a sort of um, a, a rule to go by for when we um, how we can use so many languages and still stay sane. So we, we want to make sure that whatever you're building with a new language or any language, even if we use it, is, is trivial. The, that means that if somebody comes along and doesn't understand Scala, they can go, uh, I don't know, I can't get anybody to help me with this, let me just rewrite it. And it takes them at most a day. Um, in practice so far, we've never really had to rewrite something because it was not understandable to somebody. It's always been for other reasons, but um, it's at least there as an escape hatch if, it, if we need it. And also, if you write something, it's your responsibility. Um, not meaning that it's your responsibility to only work on it and you have to fix all the bugs with it and work on all the new features and you will do everything with that. It's also your responsibility to spread the knowledge of that language um, to others. So when I, earlier this week, came up with an Elixir service, I'm now responsible for telling people about it, trying to get other people excited about it, and teaching others how to maintain that system. So here's a rough uh, illustration of how our architecture on the back end works. We have a service-oriented architecture, um, and 
uh, number one up there is where web requests first come in and they pass down to number two, which sort of spreads them out across several services down to the third layer. Then we go down to a fourth layer, which touches databases and things. And then we wrap that around through queuing systems, RabbitMQ, to another system that sort of takes care of um, other things like notifications and things like that. So you can see we have multiple layers that we go down. And the interesting thing about this is that for each service, as the web request sort of flows through it, each one of these is written in a different language. So we have things like um, Nginx with Lua in there. We have Ruby, we have a Scala um, a proxy service in there, um, and we have uh, a service written in Clojure for doing sort of filtering of information and coming up with notifications for our user. So they go through and touch all these different uh, languages as they flow through um, one web request. And the, the question that you're probably asking is why in God's name would you do this? That seems kind of ridiculous. Um, wouldn't it be, okay, maybe two languages, is that's, that's brave, and three is certainly, but why would you, on, on our back end, we now use seven different languages. Why, what's the benefit there? So there's, there's multiple reasons for why we do this. Um, and uh, the first one is sometimes we have to, sometimes we have no choice um, when it comes to this. And a perfect example of this is Java. Um, we, at, at Sex Wunderkinder, we don't particularly like Java. There's not a lot of people that do. Um, uh, but we have an Android client and you have to use Java when you uh, write Android apps. It's becoming less and less true now and we've experimented with Scala on Android. But, you know, most sane people when they build an Android app, they choose Java because that's where the tooling is, that's what Google officially supports. Um, and so we're sort of forced to, to use Java when we want to build our Android app. Um, we also want to develop uh, quicker. So sometimes we're not going quite fast enough and we need to sort of pump out new features and bug fixes as fast as we can. And um, Ruby and Rails in particular are really great at this because you can create a web service in like 15 minutes um, with Rails. And in another language, that uptime is a lot slower. Um, it takes a lot more to sort of get the wheels turning. Um, another reason is we want things to run faster. So um, Ruby and Rails are quite slow, actually. So um, what can we do to remedy that? And Scala is a perfect um, language that we use for that, speeding things up. The JVM is quite fast. Um, and Scala allows you to program much quicker, uh, to run things much quicker than uh, even JRuby would, uh, would allow you to do. Um, sometimes we want to be more expressive with what we do. Um, and Clojure is a perfect example for one of our systems where we sort of have this data in, data out flow. And the um, way that Clojure handles this data flow is just perfect. And the way the code reads is quite nicely. Um, and lastly, the last reason is we just want to learn. We want to get better as programmers. We want to look at problems in different ways. Um, and, and Haskell is cer certainly the best example of this. When you tackle a problem in Haskell um, that you've never tackled with Haskell before, you sort of see it in a whole new way because um, Haskell forces you to. So um, edification is really something that um, companies probably do not take that seriously because there's no way to measure um, edification as a way to return profit to the company. But um, believe me, it does. Um, when you have uh, an informed um, and savvy development team that's capable of sort of, you know, going from uh, Java all the way to Haskell, then they certainly are capable of solving um, any problem because they um, aren't afraid to use the tool that they know will get the job done. So now that we understand you know, why we would do this, uh, the natural question, of course, is this really a good thing? Um, and first I want to talk about the challenges because there certainly are challenges to this. This is not a, you know, a cakewalk and it's not something that I throw to everybody out in the room and say, if you're not doing this, you're doing it wrong. That's certainly not true. 
But uh, the first challenge is definitely development woes, or deployment woes, excuse me. So when you want to go ahead and deploy this system, you have to have ways of deploying every single different language. Um, and luck luckily, we have an automated process for that. So if you're not using something that helps you automate your deployments, something like Chef or Puppet, or we've rolled our own because we found those systems to be even too complex for us, um, you're just gonna you know, not be happy. And I would, I would argue that it's probably impossible to do without an automated deployment. Um, there's also the problem of context switching. So um, on a given day, I probably use three or four different programming languages, and that does have some cognitive load. When I switch from Ruby over to Clojure, um, there are times that I've just made mistakes because, oh, you know, I'm not used to uh, putting enough parentheses at the end. I'm, I forget what the, you know, what function and this library does. I forget which, how uh, I should use this over this. Sometimes you just cannot keep all this stuff in your head. I mean, that is certainly a problem. In general, though, most of the time you don't program in four or five different languages seriously in one day. You may look at some code um, in several languages, but in one day you're probably focused on one language because you're working on a certain feature or bug fixes in one sort of system that are written in one language. So in practice, this doesn't really come up that often. Um, there's also a problem of being a jack of all trades but a master of none. And what ends up being true actually is that most of us are jack of all trades and master of one. Instead we have one specialty, maybe two specialty languages where we're sort of the experts in and our coworkers are experts in other things. And so when I go to write something in Go, because I really know nothing about Go, um, if I need to do a bug fix or add something to it, I will go ahead and pair program with somebody that does know Go very, very well. Um, and they'll come to me when they need help with Scala, for instance. Um, so th hopefully that's uh, addressed some of your concerns. Now let's talk about some of the benefits. And I want to talk about the benefits to end, uh, end this talk, the benefits um, at multiple lev levels of, uh, that you can look at it. So the first level will be at the industry level, the second level will be at the organizational level, and the third uh, level will be um, at the personal level. So let's talk about uh, the industry level. Um, there's a term called value rigidity. Um, and what value rigidity talks about is sort of um, seeing the value in something and seeing it so often and so much that you're, you are rigid in those values and you, don't, you aren't capable of seeing the, the flaws or the cons of that. Um, if you use one particular language, you may sort of see great value in that language, but you come up to a problem and when it's very easily solved using something else, you're so stuck on that one language that you, you aren't even capable of seeing how hard it is or how difficult it is, how hard you're making it on yourself using that one particular tool. I mean, oftentimes we get stuck in these, these ways because we're just not capable of seeing the better um, alternative. Um, there's a term from Brian Shariah, who's a, a big guy in the Ruby community. Um, he talks about the fallacy of general purpose. And I really like this idea that we call our programming languages general purpose programming languages. Um, and while that's probably technically true, they are, most of them at least, are Turing complete. And that means they can compute anything that is computable. Um, when we call them general purpose, we're probably giving too much credit to them. There are some things that they're meant for and some things they're not. Um, take uh, writing a compiler in Erlang, certainly possible, you could do it. Would you want to? I don't know, maybe. Um, some people have done it. Um, Elixir is actually, his compiler is written mainly in Erlang. Um, it works. Is that the best idea? Could there be a better tool for it? Is C a good tool for writing a compiler? I would argue no, actually. So, um, but most people do write compilers in C. So um, we need to question these things and we need to um, ask ourselves, is the thing that we're using as an all-purpose tool really general purpose? Um, another great thing is the spread of ideas. Sometimes one language uh, is capable of expressing an idea really, really great. And from that, you can spread out to other languages. Um, so uh, 
I, I keep going back to Erlang and I'll do it again, the, the actor model um, sort of was um, not an invention of the people who came up with Erlang, but certainly um, brought to somewhat popularity through Erlang. And we were able to see the benefits of, of it in Erlang. And from that, we get things like Akka and the JVM um, that have basically direct copies of the actor model as inspired by Erlang. Um, and so this is great. We can sort of try out new ideas where they make sense. And then the good ones that we want to sort of spread other ways, we can just mishmash them together. And to go along with that, there's also avoiding groupthink. So if you're always thinking about the pro problems the same way, using the same tools, attacking them the same way, you're probably always going to think the same as, the, as others in your group. Um, and everybody will just go, yeah, that looks about right, when probably it's not right at all, or it could be done way better some other way. Um, so next, uh, we'll talk about uh, the organization level. And the reason I picked this picture, by the way, is it's the worst picture I could possibly find. So um, it's pretty good, I think. Um, so in your organization, generally, um, if you're working sort of at a competitive company, particularly a startup, you want to grab the best people. And the best people really do care about the tools that they use. Most people don't go, yeah, you know, I'm a great programmer, but you know, I'll do anything. Just give me something and yeah, okay, I'll use, sure, I'll use C++, that's fine. No, most people have preferences and you want to be able to attract, attract those people. So if you have an organization that says, hey, you come and we want you to solve problems, you choose whatever you think is best to get the job done, that is much more attractive than saying, come work for us, solve our problems, and you have to use COBOL, sorry. Um, uh, to go along with that, we have the right tool for the job. So if you have a company, you obviously want to pick what will get the job done the quickest, the fastest, the cheapest, uh, and be maintainable in the future as well. Um, and there are certain languages that are better at doing whatever you do in your domain than others, and you should pick the right one for that. Sometimes there's multiple tools that will get the job done. Um, and finally, this will get in, and the next step as well, you just have happier employees. And happier employees don't um, quit as often. They are more productive. Um, there's a bunch of literature about you know, being happy and how that affects you at the, the workplace. Um, uh, hopefully this is sort of assumed to be true now. Um, if you don't believe me, go out there and, and read some. But uh, this, is, this is really, um, I believe something that's very important for a, a functioning, competitive uh, company, having happy employees. And, and finally, I want to talk about you as the programmer and how it affects you. So, of course, there's your future. Um, there is something to be said about being the legacy programmer going forth and being the person that will maintain C++ systems 50 years from now, hopefully when we've replaced it with something else, please. Um, uh, that might be where you want to fit in your niche, but most likely, if you want to stay competitive and employable in the future, you'll have to learn something new. Um, most people that have been programming for 40 years probably are not still programming in the same language that they've always been programming in, unless they're programming in C. Um, there's also benefits of polyglotism, and this is sort of accepted when it comes to natural language. Everybody is like, man, I wish I knew one more language. Wouldn't it be great to speak French? How awesome would that be? Um, there's, it's accepted that it's good for your brain, it's good for your, it's good for your soul, it's good for being happy. Um, why is this accepted with natural language and not accepted in programming? Um, uh, I would argue that you get the same benefits um, when it comes to learning new programming languages as well. Um, and the last thing is uh, be happy. Um, hopefully, uh, at the beginning of the talk, we talked about who here programs at home in a language that they do not use at work. Um, think to yourself, wouldn't you be happier if you didn't have to do that, if you could just go to work and program with and whatever you wanted to? Would you be happier? Would you be able to um, be more fulfilled as a programmer if you could just use the tools that you would be using when you're programming in your free time? Um, and this is ultimately one of the most important things. We want, as programmers, to be happy because when we're happy, we provide value. We are more fulfilled in our jobs, and that's exactly um, what we should all be striving for. So thank you very much.
So I'm not sure if I, how much time I have, but um, I think I have some time for questions. Does anyone have questions? Yes? So does everybody on your team program in every one of the languages you showed up? So the question was, does everybody on the team program in every single one of the languages that I've shown? And the answer is no. Um, it would be awesome, and I would love this personally because I just like programming in lots of languages to be able to do every single language, but um, I don't know Objective-C. I just don't, and I haven't had time to learn it. Um, uh, I also don't really know Go that well, um, and so no, I don't really program in that, although sometimes I do touch code, and th that's true for everyone. There's just too much going on, um, and our system is big enough, um, and there's enough uh, problems out there that you don't really have to be able to program and everything. And the nice thing is that given that if something, every part of the system is trivial enough, um, if you do encounter something new, you're able to learn pretty quickly. Um, if you need to learn um, Haskell, for instance, to work on our Haskell app, um, of course, learning Haskell is quite difficult but you're not going to need to learn the Parsec library because we don't parse anything. Um, so you sort of can tackle this subset of a language and learn it for the problem that you have to solve at hand. And then if you're interested, you can go on from there. So um, in practice, um, the fact is we don't really have to know everything. Any more questions? I can't see, there, yes. Um, so the question, yeah, yeah. The question is um, about dependency management around services, uh, basically. And is there, if you change one service, will you have to change um, five other ones that depend on it? And the, that's a, a valid concern, um, but not really a valid uh, one that's exempt from any part of programming. This is something that we deal with within code bases as well, uh, and I'd actually say more so. Um, when we, we had a, a monolithic Rails application, um, and uh, what you find is that it's way easier to cheat with encapsulation when you're in the same code base than it is when you're in a service-oriented architecture. When you have services that talk to each other over may, maybe HTTP or something like that, you're forced to have very, very clear defined interfaces. Um, and everybody that programs in object orientation thinks, yes, okay, clear defined or, uh, interfaces is great, but it's really easy in most languages to sort of cheat around that. Um, in Ruby especially, you can even like call private methods pretty easily. So um, you can't call private methods from you know using HTTP and calling another service. So the, the answer is yes, that is a concern, but it's actually far less of a concern than if you had one code base. So I would argue if that is a concern of yours, then you should go service-oriented architecture because it's probably the best way to solve that that I've encountered. If you, if you want to discuss that, that's, I would be happy to. Do we have time for any more? Any more questions? Yes? I have one. Um, onboarding new developers. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so, th yeah, yeah. The question is um, uh, like onboarding new developers. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this because we haven't done a lot of hiring um, over the past uh, couple of years on our, on our back end team. Most of the people that we've hired have been client developers, and you sort of Okay, if I'm working on the Mac app, I download Xcode, good to go. Um, we do have a, a, a new woman who just started, and I'm curious to see how she handles this with the sort of, we have so many things going on, how does, you know, does she fold under the pressure? Um, my, uh, my gut feeling is that no, because it's not like when you work on a feature, you're going to have to install all of the languages that we have. Um, at most, it might be two. 
Um, and to be perfectly honest, most of the time package management is good enough um, and we have scripts set up and our, our setups are not complicated. You may have to do, you know, if you're working on a Mac, brew install RabbitMQ, brew install Redis, uh, you have the JVM already on a Mac, uh, you're good to go. Um, brew install Scala or SBT and, and you're done. So it's really, we could make it certainly easier for sure and that is a concern. But um, in practice, it hasn't been a big one yet. So we'll see. Uh, one more, yeah? Um, so the question is about uh, development and whether you need to have every single service running on your machine locally or if we use some sort of VM to run things on our machines. Um, so the answer to that is uh, no. You, um, I at most run two services at the same time. Um, this kind of goes back to the encapsulation thing. Um, we are by convention extremely strict with what we what we expose from our services. And so it sort of makes it quite easy to know whether something um, will, will work or not because you, you can sort of just tell if I create a new service, it should have these endpoints on it. You already know ahead of time. Um, and so it's very easy to sort of boot one up, run some, some tests against it, um, and know that, okay, as long as these tests pass, we, by convention, always expect services to implement these things. So while, yes, of course, um, business logic could be wrong in that, um, you sort of test that through high-level integration tests on that one service, and you are almost guaranteed that your communicating services um, will bind to that contract. Um, it is a problem because it makes uh, testing the system as a whole quite difficult and we actually never really test the, the system as a whole. We sort of, um, the, the nature of our system allows us to have blips in it so we can push something out into production, watch the monitoring tools and revert back within a matter of seconds. So um, luckily in our for our given thing, we're not running like a website that has to be up, an e-commerce website that has to be up all the time. We can have, you know, glitches where something goes a bit wrong. We return maybe more 500s than we should or something like that. Um, and it, no one will really even notice. Um, so um, for us, that's a, that's a lucky thing. And if that's not true of, in your domain, then yeah, then that's something you really need to be able to address. Uh, Yes? So I guess one of the consequences of using many languages is that people need to do quite a lot of learning yeah. of new things. And uh, that's both an opportunity and a challenge. I'm wondering if you just let people pick things up by themselves or if you have a more structured approach. Yeah. Like maybe let's introduce Haskell to these half dozen people. Yeah. Today. So the question was about um, introducing n new technologies and learning um, and how that can be a challenge um, and whether we do something more formal than please learn this um, and, and watch them learn on their own? And the answer is yes. Um, at, at the beginning, we didn't because there was just enough opportunity to just pair with somebody and you would learn that way. Um, now we're sort of, we're starting to do co-challenges where, um, for instance, we did um, one with Clojure where we said, please fetch the last 100 tweets about Zex Wundekinda from Twitter's API. And anybody that's worked with Twitter's API knows it's, kind of challenging actually. So um, uh, it was a good challenge and a lot of people who had never written Clojure before wrote some and now they are sort of diving a bit and, and pairing with people on uh, some of our Clojure systems. We're doing one right now on Scala. So yes, we do do code challenges and we highly encourage pair programming um, with new languages. And um, 
besides that, it's a lot of relying on people to be excited about what they're working on and forcing it down other people's throats, to be honest. Um, when I wrote the Elixir service earlier this week, I was so excited about it. The next day, I showed like eight people just like, hey, do you want to see something? You want to see something cool? And then like, they're like, no. And I'm like, yeah, come on. And I just like forced them over and showed them. Um, and th generally, like through osmosis and through passionate developers, um, most of the time we, uh, we learn quite easily. Um, more questions? Yeah, yes? Um, no. So, but that doesn't mean that we made mistakes. Um, well, we did make mistakes, but in terms of language choice, you, sometimes some languages I choose because I don't know. Um, Ruby being one of them, I choose Ruby often because it's so quick to just like write something up. It's kind of hard to maintain, but it's really quick to write something up that if I don't know if it's going to work, I'm going to write it in Ruby. Write it in Ruby, get it going, and then when I say, wow, this feature has traction, we need some more stability or we need to be able to run this faster, then I'll go ahead and rewrite it in Scala, for instance. Um, so. If I could rewrite everything magically, I would rewrite a lot of the Ruby stuff in Scala, but um, I'm happy that we first wrote it in Ruby, to be honest. So I guess that's it for now. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, and thank you so much for being an awesome audience.